there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Coming up on the greatest ever, the world's ultimate bombers. We'll get up close and personal with the latest high-tech Terminator and go flying in a World War II classic. Also on our list, dive bombers, torpedo bombers, and jet attack bombers. And you'll hear what it's like to drop the biggest bomb of all. There's this huge, massive explosion. It turns the Pacific from night to day. Military expert and writer Tom Clancy will tell it like it is. Well, you know, the old saying is that the fighter pilots make movies and bomber pilots make history. We'll also meet the pilots and crew who've taken these planes to hell and back. But the flak was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. So the fact that I'm here is just a luck of the draw. Flying at that speed, that height, seeing everything go past, and uh, really, I think that's what everyone joins to do. The world's greatest ever bombers are all fueled up, loaded for bear, and coming right at you. We start with the number 10 bomber. Ugly, completely obsolete, but surprisingly effective. The British Royal Navy's Fairy Swordfish Torpedo Bomber. The Fairy Swordfish is an anomaly. It had no right to be in World War II at all. Everything about it screams 1918. It's not uh, the prettiest airplane in the world, but uh, it's very nice to fly. You have to look at that airplane with love because it was a hell of an airplane to fly in, in a time when it shouldn't have been flying at all. Admirals called it the swordfish, but the crews called it the string bag because of its multiple bracing wires that held the wings together. First flown in 1935, the swordfish was an effective ship killer because it could drop high explosive torpedoes and then run for cover. Crewed by a pilot, observer and a gunner, the swordfish first made history in 1940 when it hit the Italian fleet in Taranto Harbor. Under cover of darkness, it, it went right into the harbour at Taranto and caused enormous damage to the enemy fleet. It was uh, a textbook example of what the swordfish was there to do. Goggles and flying helmet firmly fastened, the greatest ever got some airtime in a very rare and airworthy swordfish. Oh, the swordfish is a great airplane to fly and almost take your hands off and feed off the rudders in a turn. Slower than its fighter counterparts and carrying a single torpedo, the swordfish had a rather pedestrian top speed of 225 kilometers an hour. But the swordfish was designed to be stable, making it perfect for dropping torpedoes. The swordfish was a good torpedo bomber precisely because it was slow and steady, rock steady. You could put it precisely where you wanted it to be and launch a torpedo and know that it was going to launch probably. The Swordfish's slow landing and takeoff speeds made it ideal for operating from small escort carriers. But with a wingspan of 14 meters, it could have been a tight fit aboard ship. The solution? Tuck those wings back after flight and fold them forward for flying. Okay. Always stay in the same position when you fold the wings. I don't know how they do that, but it's an amazing piece of work anyway. High-strength steel locking pins keep the wings where they're supposed to be during flight. And like all carrier-based aircraft, the Swordfish was designed to stop on a sixpence. With its tail hooked down, the pilot would aim for cables stretched across the carrier's deck. The Swordfish, arguably its finest moment, was in the hunt for and destruction of the, of the Bismarck. In 1941, flying from the carrier Ark Royal, a swordfish put a crippling torpedo into the Bismarck steering gear. But why couldn't the battleship's anti-aircraft gunners knock the very slow-flying swordfish from the skies? The reason it survived its, its runs is the German fire control equipment on Bismarck didn't anticipate that anything would fly that slowly and be committed to combat, and so they kept missing by firing ahead of where the swordfish were. That's why they, 
One of them survived to, to drop the torpedo that hit Bismarck's rudder. Left steaming in circles, the Royal Navy moved in for the kill and finished off the Bismarck. But by the middle of World War II, the venerable but vulnerable swordfish was dropped as a torpedo bomber because it was getting slaughtered by enemy fighters. No matter how dangerous it was, they went in and got shot down. It was a charge of a light brigade. Dropping torpedoes was its forte. The flip side of it was that um, once you dropped your torpedo, you were very likely to be shot down. It was too damn slow. You know, there's an old saying in the Air Force, speed is life. Well, that didn't have any speed at all. The crew had no armor, so that if you killed the pilot, the, the pilot was gone. It was substandard technology for 60 years ago. But you know, the fact that people took it into combat is, is a very interesting commentary on the quality and the courage of the, of the British flight crews that took it off carriers. She had her moments of glory, but the swordfish quickly became a flying anachronism. That's why this remarkable biplane checks out in the number 10 slot of the greatest ever bombers. We've got nine more awesome aircraft coming your way, including the nuclear bomber that starred in the James Bond film Thunderball. The Swordfish claims the number 10 slot in our search for the greatest ever bombers. In the number 9 position, a terrifying symbol of Nazi power, the bent-wing Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber. The Stuka displayed Teutonic efficiency, both in delivering bombs and in scaring the crap out of the people it was attacking. There's no other aircraft that looks like that. Thank goodness. I think the Stuka looks like a mean aircraft. It's like an angry eagle diving down. It's an insult to aerodynamics, but it's a beautiful plane, actually. It's a lovely plane to fly, and I enjoy having it very much. The Stuka, crewed by a pilot and tail gunner, was the first aircraft designed specifically for dive bombing. When the German Blitzkrieg rolled over Poland, Holland, and France, the Stuka was there clearing the way for ground troops by taking out specific targets, such as bridges, tanks, troops, and bunkers. The Stuka tactic for air-to-ground coordination was brand new and highly successful during World War II. The combined arms aspect, the pilots were key in perfecting the, those techniques. The Stuka dive bomber was a very precise form of aerial artillery. By diving on the target at a low level, pilots could accurately release the bombs a very short distance from the target. I can't think of any aircraft that was more perfectly suited for its place in history than the Stuka. From a uh, operational standpoint, it was a very effective and precise dive bomber. You're essentially aiming at the target and releasing the bomb at the optimum point. Mitch Sammons owns and flies this replica Stuka dive bomber. Stuka could come down in almost in a vertical aspect to uh, hit its target, when other bombers, of course, couldn't uh, be as accurate. With a bomb that doesn't have any kind of guidance system, dive bombing is the best way to do it. And the steepest you can dive it and aim it at the target, the more chance you have of success. The Stuka's speed-limiting dive brakes were key in slowing this bomber down and making it accurate and stable in the dive. It was one of those aircraft that you could put into a very steep dive and it would not accelerate. The Stuka was also the first bomber to actively use a terrifying form of psychological warfare. But to add insult to injury, with typically German humor, if you will, they added a, a siren that made the thing scream like a banshee as it came down. French soldiers would just put their heads down and cower because of this noise, and they knew they were going to get bombs very soon. Everybody leaped to claim the credit for it. Hitler said that it was his idea, and I suspect it was some smart mechanic who put a siren on the, on the airplane, and, and then everybody took the credit. German engineers realized that in a near vertical attack, the Stuka could, in theory, knock off its own propeller with its bomb. So they came up with a solution, a special bomb cradle. This cradle, of course, was a breakthrough in design as well, and it uh, swung, actually swung, this bomb represents a, about a 500 pounder, and it would swing this whole uh, bomb downward, releasing it down here outside of the uh, propeller's arc. So that was important, of course, for accuracy, but also to maintain uh, the uh, safety of keeping it from hitting the propeller. 
Right after bomb release, the Stuka would pull up steeply, putting five or six times the force of gravity on the pilot. At this point, most pilots were suffering from G-induced blackout, but the Stuka was designed to automatically pull out of the dive. The autopilot would take over and make sure that aircraft pulled out of its dive at about 1,400 feet. Obviously, the pilot would regain his composure and take the aircraft controls back over with the autopilot off. The Stuka, a formidable strike weapon in Europe, took a terrific beating during the Battle of Britain against RAF fighters. The aircraft's limitations became glaringly apparent. It was a good bombing platform, but it uh, couldn't defend itself against other airplanes. This was a shock to the Luftwaffe because uh, up to that point, the Stukas had been absolutely deadly. When the Nazis had complete air superiority, the Stukas could operate with impunity. Once that air superiority was lost, they were in trouble. The Royal Air Force uh, thought that going after a Stuka was kind of like kicking a baby seal. After being shot out of the skies over Britain, the Stuka was re-equipped with large caliber cannons and reassigned to the Russian front with a new role. The Stuka became a tank killer par excellence, and they could, uh, could open a tank up like a tin can. But against Russian tanks, the Stuka was still completely useless without fighter protection. The Ju-87 Stuka stands firm at number nine. And let's face it, this dive bomber was just plain nasty. Number eight on our list of the greatest ever bombers is the remarkable World War I Italian heavy bomber, the Caproni C-36. The Caproni is certainly the, an exemplar of strategic bombing, probably the first, and probably the most effective of its type. It wasn't beautiful. It certainly wasn't graceful. But it was functional. It looks so crude and so unusual, uh, but really it was advanced technology for the time. It's 1915, 12 years after the Wright brothers' first flight, and the Caproni is flying from Italy over the Alps and hitting Austrian targets. With a 23-meter wingspan, it could carry 770 kilograms of bombs on a 640-kilometer return trip. Historically significant, this first-generation bomber was a new weapon, and it fired the imaginations of military thinkers. The Caproni series of huge airplanes were a startling influence on bombing. No one had built airplanes that big to carry bombs, and Italy was the first to do so, and it had remarkable successes. The Caproni was surprisingly successful because um, it could carry a ton of bombs, and generally speaking, it did an awful lot of damage. It was an effective aircraft. They conducted and made it arguably the most successful strategic air campaign in World War I, and it's largely unknown. What's also largely unknown is that American pilots flew the Caproni bomber. They were attached to the Italian Air Force and flew the CA-36s on actual strategic missions. And from that grew the American strategic bombing tradition. Although the Caproni looks fragile and barely airworthy, it did carry a combat crew of four, and there was no such thing as a comfortable flight for these men. Crossing the Alps in winter, exposed cockpits, Absolutely appalling. The American pilots came back and described it. They said it were no trim tabs on that airplane. So you had to fly the whole mission with your elbows stuck in your stomach, holding the stick forward with a constant weight on your hand all the time. The comfort level in the Caproni was atrocious. It was cold, it was windswept. Uh, there's, there's nothing good that you could say about the comfort level uh, except when it got you back on the ground. The airplanes are literally held together by wire and they're covered in fabric. And the top speed of this airplane is the kind of courage it must have taken to get inside of these airplanes without the safety protection that, that pilots have now. Flying at high altitudes in the freezing cold were one thing, but the Caproni was also the opposite of streamlined, making it very, very slow. The Caproni was not fast. You'd get it up to 80 miles an hour as soon as you could after takeoff, and that was it is one of those airplanes that people said tended to antagonize the air rather than pass through it. The drag on one of those things is, in, is enormous. So 80 miles an hour was about it. Although the Caproni looks anachronistic and, and even peculiar, it was a well-designed airplane. And the Italian Air Force were fond of this bomber, keeping it in service until 1929. 
So we say goodbye to the Caproni at number 8 on our list of the greatest ever. It had a huge impact on the whole concept of aerial warfare, but with its open cockpit and long missions, it was hell on its crews. The number seven bomber on our list has the style of an Italian sports car, the no-nonsense approach of German engineering, and the daring-do approach of the British. No surprise, really, because this bomber was a 1979 British, Italian, and German co-production. The Panavia Tornado low-level fast attack bomber. The brilliant thing about Tornado is, you, you name it, we can take it. From very deep bunkers, many miles away, to, to localize troops. I flew the Tornado in the, the mid-80s at, at Bruggen, uh, and it, it was a phenomenal aeroplane. It was gobsmackingly impressive. The ride at low level is rock solid. Designed as a multi-role aircraft, the Tornado is a two-seat, twin-engine, fighter interceptor and a bomber, all rolled into one tight package. Armed with 27mm cannons, the Tornado can also carry some 8,000 kilograms of bombs. It was a, a very capable aircraft in terms of the weapon load it could carry and the, the delivery accuracy of the, of the bombs that it could, it, it could carry on the aircraft. Very, very capable aeroplane. Greatest ever met up with Royal Air Force pilot Flight Lieutenant Jim Bex to find out what makes his unique swing wing Tornado GR4 so special. As you can see here, it's fully forward in 25 degree. We can actually sweep it back so it almost clips the tailorons at the back at 67. And that as the jet accelerates, then we'll sweep them back uh, so it can go supersonic. Swept forward for takeoff and landing and swept back for high speed, the swing wing makes the Tornado versatile, but it comes at a price. You don't get something for nothing. So a swing wing airplane will be a heavier airplane than an airplane that was designed just for that one fixed configuration. But the extra weight of the swing wing design isn't a problem for the tornado. Putting the hammer down is what this jet loves to do. Close to every pilot's heart is the engines. A tornado GR4 is a very powerful aircraft. She weighs 14 tons just on her own, she can get airborne with 28 and a half, including fuel. In other words, the Tornado can carry double its empty weight, and with afterburners, is capable of going 2.2 times the speed of sound. Using terrain-following radar, the Tornado is designed to fly hands-free at a blistering 1,100 kilometers per hour at treetop level. Underneath here are two radars. One's a ground mapping radar, and the second one's a terrain-following radar. That one looks outside, analyzes the ground and means the jet can fly itself. And we normally fly at night in cloud at 200 feet with the pilot with his hands touching the canopy. The aircraft will fly the mission for you. 100 feet, 600 knots, terrain following at night in weather. You have to trust it, of course. Because the Tornado bomber behaves like a fighter plane, it presents a new wrinkle traditional bomber pilots rarely had to contend with, G-force. So pilots like Jim Beck wear the never-out-of-fashion runway accessory, the G-suit. So it's pretty much like a tube of toothpaste, and it will squeeze you from the bottom of the suit initially, pushing the blood up through the legs and into your tummy. From your tummy, we squeeze our six-packs, um, for most of us, and at that stage, then that keeps the blood up into the head, and uh, that is predominantly where you need to keep it. The Tornado participated in some of the most dangerous missions of Operation Desert Storm in 1991, specializing in hitting Iraqi airfields. The Iraqi Air Force had huge airfields that were very difficult to close down, and the Tornado could do it. In that first week, we lost five Tornadoes to anti-aircraft fire, not because it was accurately fired. You know you've got a low-level aircraft coming through, you just open fire straight up. When you're down, down that low, a guy with a rifle can shoot at you. That can be very bad luck. Jim Beck was just a kid during the first Gulf War, but he was over Baghdad the night of the latest aerial light show in 2003. His job was to take out Iraqi SAMs, or surface-to-air missile sites. I was going against radar systems which were designed to shoot down other aircraft. So we saw 700 cruise missiles go in, and then one minute later, fired my rockets. Uh, from about 20 miles away. It was a big moment in my life. Successful and capable, but the Tornado doesn't really know what it wants to be, a bomber or a fighter. 
depends on how the pilot feels at the time. I mean, they can flip a switch and go fight her if they want, which they'll do in a New York minute if they have to. But really, it was designed as a tack bomber. All airplanes, Panavia, Tornado included, suffer when they really have more than one role. And in this case, it has four or five roles. And so if you really wanted to have a greater uh, air superiority fighter, you'd trim off some of its other roles and, and tailor it to that. In my assessment, it's a better bomber. So as an interceptor, capable airplane, as a fighter, nope, but as a bomber, good airplane. The fighter pilots will kill me for that. Low and fast and exposed, the Tornado is a jack-of-all-trades, but a true master of none. The highly versatile Panavia Tornado stays in the number seven slot. Number six on our list of the greatest ever, the quintessentially British nuclear bomber and star of the James Bond film Thunderball, the Avro Vulcan. The Avro Vulcan has a sculptural beauty that's just uh, mind-stopping. You look at the airplane and you think, my god, what a beautiful airplane. Incredible machine, absolutely incredible. To turn an aircraft as big as that, that the sound and the power, awesome. The Vulcan was a marvelous airplane to show off in. I mean, you know, at air shows and things like that, it was tremendous. The triangular or delta-winged Vulcan grew out of the RAF's need for a nuclear attack bomber that could go the distance, Moscow and back. First showing off the very fashionable nuclear flash white, the Vulcan went operational in 1960. It could carry 10,000 kilos of nuclear or conventional bombs. That's roughly equivalent to 12 family cars. The Avro Vulcan was a phenomenon for its age. Here we've got a huge delta, pure delta, and is going to operate at 60,000 feet and be a nuclear penetrator against the Soviet Union. That's what it was designed to do. Do that wonderfully well, wonderfully well. The Vulcan is powered by four Olympus jet engines that put out a total of 36,000 kilos of thrust, giving a maximum speed approximately 0.95 Mach, or 1,000 kilometers an hour. And the Vulcan, or Tin Triangle, also had a reputation for having the agile flying characteristics of a fighter, not a bomber. The aircraft is very maneuverable, and certainly during its heyday, uh, contemporary fighters just could not outturn it at height. We had an exercise in Australia uh, where they had Mirage aircraft, and uh, we were in a turning battle with a Mirage up around 45,000 feet, and uh, we kept turning, and he gave up and went home. The delta wing configuration of the Vulcan was its most distinctive feature, but it wasn't just for show. The Vulcan is an appealing aircraft, both aesthetically and from an engineering logical standpoint. The thickness of that wing allows you to house a lot of things inside of it, a lot of crew area, bomb compartments, and so forth. It has very peculiar characteristics. For example, you can fly a delta wing up to an extremely high angle of attack in the air and it will still fly straight and level if you've got the power to make it go along. Just as fashion changes with the times, so did the Vulcan, which got a new role and a new paint job after improved Soviet missile technology meant the bombers were vulnerable at altitude. So it was adapt or die. The Vulcan was now a low-level camouflaged attack bomber. So at the last minute you'd come to 500 feet, open the doors and hit the release button and the bombs would come off in a stick. Ching, 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 ching. And even then, you could feel the blast of the bomb hit you as you went past, so it wasn't a good idea to go much lower. Already on the RAF chopping block in 1982, the Vulcan won a reprieve and its first and only taste of combat during the Falklands War. Obviously, sending a Vulcan was one very persuasive message because although they used it to drop a bomb on the runway at Port Stanley, it was a clear message that mainland Argentina was in reach. It turned out to be a round trip of over 8,000 miles, which at the time was the longest bombing sortie that had ever been attempted. Flying the Vulcan in combat was stressful enough for the crew, but like many things British, the Vulcan had a class system, which in an emergency meant that in all likelihood, only the pilots would survive. It was an us and them aircraft. The two pilots sat on ejection seats. The three rear crew sat down the back in a black hole. They could not see out. They were facing to the rear and they were not on ejection seats. If you got a serious problem at low level, and we did have several aircraft do this, 
the rear crew were unquestionably going to die. The Vulcan, as cool as it looks, bows out at number six because there just weren't enough ejection seats to go round. And to add insult to injury, the bomber ended its flying career as an aerial tanker. We're halfway through our greatest ever countdown. So far, we've had a remarkable torpedo bomber and an incredible low-level high-speed attack bomber. But still to come, Bomber Command's favorite World War II heavy metal. We've seen five excellent aircraft, but there are another five to go before we find out which is the greatest ever bomber. Up next in the number five slot is an aircraft that always impresses with its sheer size and brutish power, the Russian Cold War giant, the Tu-95 Bear nuclear bomber. It was certainly a cool looking bird. The Russian airplanes designers always had a great aesthetic. They made pretty airplanes. Unusual looking, swept wing, yet with turboprops. Very fast, very long range, very high altitude. It is unquestionably one of the huge icons of the Cold War. Built by the Tupolev Design Bureau, the Bear was the ultimate symbol of Soviet power. Its massive 51 meter swept wings are impressive, but its coolest feature, four turboprop engines turning eight contra-rotating propellers, which gave this bomber incredible fuel efficiency and range. A contra-rotating propeller consists of two propellers, pretty much right in front of the other, and one goes one way and one turns in the opposite sense. It's mechanically complex, and many uh, contra-rotating propeller projects in the past have failed just because of that, but the Russians got it right, and it's been a reliable system for them. It's the first swept-wing airplane to have uh, turboprop engines, and uh, the United States toyed with the idea, tried, had, ran a lot of engineering studies, and could never, never achieve it. But those big, massive 18-foot counter-rotating props just propel the airplane at near jet speeds over enormous ranges. It was and it is a great airplane. The mighty bear will be remembered as a key player during the Cold War's cat and mouse games, constantly probing European and North American airspace for weaknesses. Tremendous capability uh, and uh, certainly uh, spooked us. You know, it used to come around the North Cape quite a lot and to be intercepted by uh, British fighters. Uh, so certainly in the height of the Cold War, uh, quite, quite a uh, formidable airplane to, uh, to be up against. Many Cold War bombers were marginalized by the intercontinental ballistic nuclear missile. But the Bear, an adaptable creature capable of lifting 46,000 pounds of weapons, was tasked with taking out US Navy aircraft carriers with long-range missiles. They hung all sorts of stuff on it. So you could put standoff weapons on that thing. If you can stand off and fire weapons, it can be very effective. Where the Tu-95s were really, really hazardous was when they put missiles on them and, and they became essentially a carrier group killing aircraft. Very, very difficult to defend against and, and, a, and a massive threat. The Bear's contra-rotating propellers may have helped with range and endurance, but the noise, the noise. If Cold War fighter pilots have seen any Russian aeroplane up close and personal, it's likely to have been a Bear. Even through their own bone dome, under the canopy with their own aeroplane noise, they could hear those contra-rotating props from a huge distance away. And once they got up close to take pictures, the thing was deafening. So noisy, in fact, that the Americans could hear the bomber with underwater listening devices that were meant to track Soviet subs. I've always loved the bear. The funny thing about the bear is that the Navy could track the bear on SOSIS the sonar surveillance system that they used, to, they had the Atlantic Ocean wired like a pinball to uh, track Russian submarines. They could also track the bear because of a unique uh, frequency um, harmonic. It came off the, the big counter-rotating propellers. That really flipped me out when I, I learned that. The inimitable Tu-95 Bear stays in the number five position because for a bomber, it's just a bit embarrassing when you can be hunted like Red October. Our number four choice for greatest ever bombers is the so far invincible American stealth superstar, the B-2 Spirit Bomber. The B-2 is a remarkable example of what the Americans can do. It's 
technologically brilliant and mind-bogglingly expensive. With the B-2, the discussion is not how many aircraft do we need to destroy this target. It is how many targets can we destroy with this aircraft. We can go all the way around the world, drop bombs, and come back home. We can do that quickly, we can do it effectively, and we can do it unnoticed. It is the most incredibly uh, powerful single weapon system that's ever been constructed. It is an extraordinary beast. The stealth bomber first saw combat in 1999 when it hit Serbian targets during the Kosovo War. And the B-2 continues to see action in the Gulf and Afghanistan, setting records in the process. In fact, the longest combat mission in the history of aviation was flown by a B-2 flying from Whiteman Air Force Base. 44 hours, they flew from here to Afghanistan and opened the war. And that's what we do, is we, we go in first. And a fold-down bed service for those long flights isn't part of the drill. There's only room for two of us up there. Behind us, there's just kind of a little walkway that the door closes up in. And we usually put a cot down there when we're flying our long durations to be able to sleep in between important events. Many aspects of this freakish-looking stealth bomber are still top secret. Its top speed is reportedly high subsonic, 900 kilometers an hour at 11,000 meters, and it can carry 23,000 kilos of bombs. We can actually take, in this plane by itself, 80 500-pound JDAMs that are all satellite-guided. They all have an antenna in the tail. So I could take one B-2 bomber and basically take out 80 targets. From 1,200 meters, the B-2 can drop a bomb within three meters of the target. But this bomber's unique ability to remain unseen by the enemy's air defenses is what it's all about. The B-2 uses complex and ever-changing curves to achieve radar invisibility by deflecting radar signals away and not back to the enemy. The stealth bomber is also covered with radar-absorbent material that soaks up the enemy's radar signals. Different coatings do different things. Some coatings allow uh, radar energy to be absorbed. Some reflect radar energy. The unique-looking B-2 with its 52-meter wingspan is what's known as a flying wing because it doesn't have a tail like traditional aircraft. No tail. How many airplanes do you see with no tail? And that requires a lot of computer power, a lot of uh, different flight control um, functions that we have. But uh, technology is at that state now where that, that can happen. Without the computerized stability system, the B-2 bomber would go totally out of control. It relies upon its computers for its stability. So let's hope they have a good computer system that doesn't crash, because if it crashes, the aircraft crashes. The B-2's flying wing design generates a lot of lift, and that means the pilots need to pay special attention during landing. The B-2 is different from most any other plane you'll ever fly. There's lots of lift, way too much lift. This plane, you have to, you have to fly it down, hold it, hold it, hold it, until you can't stand it anymore, and you just almost fly it right into the ground. And just touch the stick a little bit, and it kisses the ground. It's a really nice airplane. If you flare at all, it'll flow down the runway. That's what it does. Going to war in a stealth bomber may very well be one of the safest ways to hit the enemy. And that's just fine by the politicians and the pilots. It can go out, it can hit its targets and stand a very good chance of coming back undetected. And in today's world where there's such a, a resistance to taking any casualties, that's a, an enormously important capability. It's kind of nice to know that you're invisible that people aren't going to get you. My family feels good about that. I feel good about that. It makes me feel safe. The B-2 was first designed to fly nuclear strike missions to the USSR. With the end of the Cold War and deep defense cuts, only 21 of these hyper-expensive bombers have been built. Each B-2 comes with a price tag that's close to $1.2 billion. No one would buy and build a B-2 today. And certainly, had the B-2 not already been in production, no one would have continued funding it. You also have to take into account what it's intended to do. It is a way of projecting power. It's a 21st century gunboat. Now, the B-2 is designed to keep our country free and, and safe and make life very hard on our country's enemies. What's that worth? It's worth a lot. It can go and project power throughout the world. And that's what this airplane's about, is global strike and global power. Because of the billion-dollar price tag, low production numbers, and short combat history, the B-2 comes in at number four on our list of the greatest ever bombers.
in the number three slot, the sharp end of RAF Bomber Command during World War II, the Avro Lancaster. If the British public remembered two aeroplanes from the war, it's the Spitfire and the Lancaster. The Lancaster could take a tremendous amount of pounding. It was a fantastic aeroplane. It was the best rip bomber of the war. It had an enormous bomb load, so it wrecked your whole day. Yeah, the Lancaster must be one of the greatest bombers ever, if not the greatest bomber ever, I would say. Entering combat in 1942, the four-engined Lancaster was king of the nighttime raids into Germany. It had a crew of seven and could carry a heavier load than any other bomber in the European theater. Huge bomb bay. Enormous capacity bomb bay. No other aircraft in World War II lifted a single bomb weighing 22,000 pounds, but the Lancaster did. The Lancaster's 1942 Dambuster raids, one of the most audacious bombing missions in history. The target, German dams in the Ruhr. The Lank carried a massive 4,000 kilo spinning bomb, which could skip on water before exploding against the dam. The Dambuster raid cost the lives of some of Bomber Command's best aircrew. It was a very expensive mission, but it achieved its objectives and it did huge damage to the German war economy. The Lank's ability to lift so many bombs was in large part thanks to her four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Altogether, the Lank's engines could put out some 7,000 horsepower. Most people by now will have heard a P-51 Mustang flyby. And of course, the Lancaster sounds like four of them. So you get this wonderful, it's a sort of educated snarl. And taking those Merlins flying is what it's all about. Controls are remarkably well harmonized. It's quite heavy at low speed, as you would expect. But at high speed, at cruising speed, the controls are quite precise. And you can be quite positive with it. And it uh, trims out beautifully, handles very, very well. Lovely aeroplane. It was, it was really easy to fly. It, it operated almost like a like a fighter. The Lancaster wasn't just a purveyor of death. In the winter of 44-45, the bomber was used to drop emergency food supplies into occupied Holland. These people in that corner of Holland were starving. We had to drop food. And there were suddenly our bomb bays, instead of being full of uh, bombs, of course, death and destruction, were full of uh, you know, oatmeal, flour, baker's chocolate, big tins. It was, it was quite a feeling. The scenes you saw outside your front windscreen, which were just almost staring at people, eyeball to eyeball, were quite dramatic. The Lank carried a crew of seven on the dangerous missions over Germany. The tail gunner, or tail end Charlie, was usually the first to get hit during a night fighter attack. The main thing we had to do was to avoid a conflict with the enemy aircraft, was to get away from it, because they had more powerful guns than we had. First time I saw an enemy aircraft, and I saw it coming in, just called it coming in on a curve of pursuit. We notified the pilot, called him up, and we took evasive action. But running away from enemy fighters wasn't often an option for the Lancaster. It had a weakness that was heavily exploited by German night fighters. It didn't have a belly turret. The Lancaster couldn't defend itself. When the Germans attacked the Lancaster, they always came from underneath. You put upward firing cannon in the night fighter. He comes in underneath where the bombers can't see him, positions himself a couple of hundred feet below, opens fire, blows the wing off. Fear is, you can not only feel it, you can taste it. You can say, what does it taste like? It tastes like dry sawdust. And fear itself comes from the back of your neck, right up to the top of your head. You can feel it, you can feel it every time because these people are very good at their business and they're trying to kill you. The total casualty rate for RAF Bomber Command was over 50%, making the chances of surviving a tour of 30 missions unlikely. If you count all the air crew that flew with Bomber Command, it's about 120,000 men, 55,000 dead. After a tour of 30 combat missions, the war was over for most RAF air crew, but some, like Alfred Hooperman, went back for more. I volunteered to go back to do a second tour. The adrenaline of being on a bomber station with all the crews, it got into your system. When I look at it, I wonder where all the years have gone. It's 60 years, but 
it still is a great experience to stand by it. It's nostalgic, very nostalgic. The Lancaster leaves honorably in the number three spot because of a fatal weakness, no belly turret, something the next bomber on our list had from day one. In the number two spot on the greatest ever bombers is one of the most recognizable planes of World War II, the B-17 Flying Fortress. Yeah, the B-17 was a Cadillac of the bombers. Beautiful bird, absolutely gorgeous, the B-17. I love this airplane because you could do an awful lot of damage to a B-17 and it will still take you back. With a crew of 10, the B-17 Flying Fortress served in every World War II combat zone, but is best known for daylight strategic bombing of German industrial targets. Cruising at 270 kilometers an hour, its maximum short-range bomb load was 8,000 kilos of iron or dumb bombs. The US Army Air Force philosophy was that its bombers would fight their way through to the target, and to do that, they had to be heavily armed. The media dubbed the bomber the Flying Fortress because of its 13 50 caliber machine guns. As soon as I saw a German plane, I tried to get him in the sight, and if I had him in the sight, I, all I did was hit the trigger switches. Here comes one in this direction, another direction. Here he comes, Porter, get him, get him. Hitting a target going that fast with a firearm is not all that easy. Even if you've got 10 50 caliber machine guns, 300 plus mile an hour target is going to be a hard thing to hit. 60 years ago, pilot Ken Hodenot and ball turret gunner Bud Porter flew the B-17 in combat. Without German fighters and flak to contend with, the greatest ever took them for a flight down memory lane in the Liberty Bell. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's sure is. Have the controls? I got them. Yes, sir. And if you just want to keep a left hand turn coming around. Boy, that thing is hard to steer. <laughs> the B 17's toughness was legendary. Losing an engine or a few feet of wing didn't knock it out of the sky. A shell went through our left wing between one and two engines, it put a gigantic hole between the two engines and threw out oil. I've never experienced vibration like this in my life. But the B 17 brought back so many with holes in them, vertical stabilizers shot off. Uh, several came back with uh, gunners flying the airplane back after the uh, pilot, co-pilot, and sometimes navigator bombardier who were really exposed up front were blown out. It's a hell of an airplane. So why could the B-17 take a beating and still manage to make it home? The B-17 was tough because it just had extra metal. I always said it was sort of like the 1953 Buick philosophy, you know, just make it big, make it heavy. Just confirms what I've always said, the greatest airplane ever built. You're doing perfect. Made me feel like I was 21 years old again, really did. B-17 missions were flown at altitudes of 6,000 meters or more, and that meant dealing with extreme cold. Over the Class A uniform, we wore an electrically heated suit. And then over the electrically heated suit, fur line jackets, pants, boots, etc. Oh, what a nice day to fly. Oh, yeah. Every day is. You know, I'm in a nice air conditioned <laughs> cockpit. And... Well, we got it once in a while, 60 below zero. Hard to believe. The B-17 dropped some 500,000 tons of bombs on European targets in daylight raids, but it came at a price. Almost 5,000 B-17s were shot down with a loss of some 47,000 aircrew. One time it's an airplane with 10 men, and the next minute it's just a big black puff. It was an experience that was uh, worth a million dollars that you wouldn't pay a nickel to do again. It was only later in the war that the loss rate dropped, thanks in large part to the greatest ever fighter, the long-range bomber escort, the P-51 Mustang, which took on the Luftwaffe fighters. Remember that we call these B-17s the Flying Fortress, fight in, fight out. 
Well, they got tremendous losses. A Mustang could stay with the B-17s. They could go anywhere the B-17s went and bring them home. It was a P-51 that really saved us, saved us, because then they could fly all the way into the target and all the way back. So the B-17 stays in the number two position of the greatest ever bombers. The bomber just couldn't live up to its nickname, the Flying Fortress, without the help of fighter escort. But for Ken and Bud, flying the B-17 remains a greatest ever experience. It's a great airplane. Bowie well, built a super airplane, and in this, is special good. That's probably the, the greatest thrill I've had since World War II. Coming up next in the number one slot, the greatest ever bomber. Here's a hint. Most of the pilots flying this beast today weren't even born when this bomber entered service. In the number one slot of the greatest ever bombers, the undisputed aerial heavyweight champion of the world, the B-52 Stratofortress. First designed to take nuclear Armageddon on a one-way trip to the Soviet Union, this bomber continues to see frontline service in the Gulf and Afghanistan. The B-52 is not exactly a pretty aircraft, but it gets the job done. We don't necessarily make a lot of movies, but we'll make a lot of history. It's almost as old as I am. Yeah, I mean, you have grandchildren of the first flight crews who are now flying the airplanes on, on operational missions. You may hear the B-52 referred to as the buff. In our community, that stands for the big, ugly, fat fellow. It's a great plane, and I couldn't imagine flying anything else. Big, ugly, fat fella, indeed. The buff first flew in 1952 and has been a busy camper ever since. It's carpet bombed North Vietnam, smashed Iraqi National Guard units in both Gulf Wars, fired cruise missiles at Serbian targets, and dropped bunker-busting bombs on Al-Qaeda positions in Afghanistan. The greatest ever got the inside scoop on the buff from B-52 combat pilot Brandon Parker. We're ready, crew. You may hear certain uh, cliches when you're talking about the B-52. Flying artillery may be one of them. Uh, if you think about it, we carry a lot of bombs and we're able to orbit on station and provide support to those coalition ground forces uh, for an extended amount of time. And, and that's a great, great capability for us. In the 1960s, before most present-day B-52 pilots were born, the B-52 was the Cold War's 24-7, go-anywhere nuclear enforcer. It was a tremendous deterrent. It just the Soviet Union couldn't deal with it. Nikita Khrushchev, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, often remarked that he, in all his decisions, he had to keep in mind that on patrol on his borders were B-52s armed with nuclear weapons ready to come in at a single moment. And so he thought that over very carefully and back down. The B-52 can lift a staggering 31 and a half thousand kilograms of mixed weapons, including nuclear and conventional bombs. In weight terms, that's like carrying 40 family cars. The Buff's immensely strong wings not only lift the bomb load, but are filled with fuel to give the bomber its enormous range. As our gross weight increases, the wingtips actually get lower to the ground. That's why it's important that we have the uh, tip gear out here because we do carry a lot of the fuel in our wings. When we land, depending on our gross weight, those tip gear will actually hit the ground and start rolling uh, to provide some stability out on the wings. I imagine some of the older engineers were downright alarmed to see those wings droop when it's sitting on the ground. It just seems so counter to everything that was the, was orthodoxy in aircraft design up to that point, but they did it and it was successful. The key to the B-52's success and longevity goes back to its design. It's because it's a marvelous airframe. It's almost indestructible. It's so big, you can stack all sorts of things in it. Uh, your avionics get out of date, you rip them out and you put a new set in. The engines perhaps could do with some more power. Take them off, put new ones on. They're podded engines, it's easy. And that plane was not designed to live for 20,000 hours of flight time. The designers and the, and the builders did a really good job putting the airplane together. Just, you know, Mercedes lasts a long time if you maintain it properly. So does the B-52. 
From carpet bombing to precision bombing, the B-52 is now carrying out missions it was never originally designed for. With the more advanced weaponry, we're able to load almost any type of weapon on here, employ that weapon, and support coalition ground forces. And we're actually employing the B-52 in ways that we never dreamed of uh, back at its creation. However, dropping nuclear bombs is what the buff was originally designed for, and it was the star of Stanley Kubrick's classic anti-war film, Dr. Strangelove. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. A few B-52 pilots, like Walter Boyne, got to experience an atomic bomb drop during testing. There's this huge, massive explosion. It turns the Pacific from night to day. I mean, brighter than day. You just can't imagine. And it's not just, you know, a little bit ahead of you or a little bit behind you. It's the whole world. It's just like the night has been destroyed. It's just unbelievable. We have an old navigator on board, Blake White. He said, every head of state should see this. And it's really true. But to experience it, you realize what you're playing with. The B-52 is the greatest ever bomber, and the buff's greatest ever achievement is, without a doubt, not dropping a nuke in anger. Any weapon system is money well spent as long as you never have to use it. In the case of SAC and the B-52s, they never had to drop nuclear weapons on anybody, and that's the definition of winning the Cold War. When it's all said and done, this B-52 will have performed its mission for almost 80 years. 80 years, no other bomber in history will be able to say that. The greatest ever bomber, the B-52.